Right, we've now talked about uh, the concept of classifiers. We focused a lot on binary classifiers, but in this last set of videos, we've actually talked about multi-class classifiers. Uh, I wanted to say a few other things uh, before we finish this off and move on to uh, our next uh, topic. The SGD classifier that we've been using, uh, it requires uh, having uh, purely numerical data. So in situations where we actually have categorical data that's coming in as inputs, we actually have to take an explicit step of making conversion over to numerical data. Uh, the SGD classifier is also limited to constructing linear decision surfaces. And for many things that we do, this is uh, sufficient. And, and, if, and if that's the case, then this is the choice we should make. Uh, but there are, uh, there are lots of other approaches out there that allow us to do uh, nonlinear, uh, that allow us to express nonlinear decision surfaces. And what we saw in our discussion also with the SGD classifier, because it is fundamentally a binary uh, classifier, uh, is that uh, when we are faced with a scenario where we have multiple classes, we, we actually have to take some extra steps in order to address that scenario. And in particular, we have to construct not just one linear classifier, but a whole set of them. We didn't really talk about the, uh, the set of parameters that uh, one can set uh, for the SGD classifier. And when I say parameter here, I'm really, uh, really meaning hyperparameter. Uh, I encourage you to go and look at the formal scikit-learn documentation for the SGD classifier as it lists all of the parameters and gives you a, a fairly clear description of what each one does but I, I did want to, to touch on a, a few of these. Um, first off, you can uh, make a choice of what your cost function is or, or loss function. We were using uh, lo the logistic uh, regression type approach, but there are a, a variety of other things that you can choose. You can also make a choice uh, about uh, whether to use regularization and, uh, and then what type of regularization. We'll talk about this in more detail as we get into regression, uh, but you can uh, make choices as to whether or not to use uh, L1 or L2 based regularization or mix those together. And this regularization mechanism is really all about uh, trying to prevent overfitting of the data. We were specifying the maximum number of gradient descent iterations. And this is, uh, th this is a parameter, especially when you're starting to uh, execute uh, many different models or learn many different uh, models or try out many different combinations of hyperparameters. Uh, this is a parameter that you might actually want to start turning down uh, to, to smaller numbers. The tolerance parameter uh, allows you to um, to uh, control early stopping of the learning process. Uh, and in particular, what it does is it measures the, uh, the magnitude of the gradient that's being computed. And once that magnitude uh, reaches a low enough value, that, that means that, the, uh, that our, that error surface that we were looking at uh, earlier in the set of videos, once that error surface starts to get very flat, uh, that's going to cause the learning algorithm to, uh, to terminate early, assuming you're using to tolerance. You can uh, also adjust the learning rate. So uh, for every step, uh, once you make a judgment about what the gradient is, how that, so that tells you what direction you need to be stepping in. The question is how big of a step should you, should you make? And the, the learning rate allows you to control that. It is also possible uh, to uh, set up the learning rate such that it's either constant, that's the default behavior, or you can set it up to where it is uh, something that's adaptive. Uh, and in, in that situation, we actually engage yet another algorithm to make choices about uh, how that learning rate should be changing over time. One can also turn on early stopping 
using yet another independent data set, and I've sort of danced around the, the validation data set so far. We'll get more into that here in a few weeks. Uh, but the idea is that once performance uh, stops improving for an independent data set, and, and in fact starts to turn back upwards, get worse, then that's the uh, correct time to actually stop the learning process. So we've only scratched the surface for classifiers. Uh, and we're going to be uh, getting into some bigger ideas here pretty soon. Uh, in particular, we'll be exploring nonlinear decision surfaces. Uh, we'll also talk about trying to pick decision surfaces that uh, are as smooth as possible uh, so that we avoid uh, overfitting. Uh, and one of the topics that comes up uh, in uh, the area of support vector machines is that uh, sometimes it's better to explicitly make a choice to uh, mislabel certain training set uh, elements in order to make the model as simple as possible. We'll, we'll talk about that. Uh, and uh, we'll also start working with some models that actually explicitly allow for uh, input data that are categorical in nature and not just uh, numerical in nature. So we've talked about a variety of different kinds of metrics for uh, classifiers. For binary classifiers, it's really easy to talk about precision and recall. Uh, the, the true positive rate and true negative rates were uh, very intuitive. Uh, and then uh, when it came time to summarize the behavior of a model before we actually picked a threshold, uh, the receiver operator characteristic curve or ROC curve uh, turned out to give us some nice intuition there. And we can actually measure the performance of a model uh, in terms of the area under that ROC curve. Also gave you a hint about uh, skill scores and in particular the Pierce skill score is something that we tend to use in, in my lab. These Metrics, uh, as I presented them, really are geared toward uh, binary classification problems, but there are equivalent kinds of ideas in the multi-class uh, kind of a case, but those tend to, to get into more uh, complicated mathematics. We also started talking about cross-validation. The, the book, as I said, only gives you a limited view of uh, cross-validation. Um, the key idea is that when we are uh, reporting the performance of a model, those reports, those reported metrics should only be based on uh, test data that are completely independent of data that we've used to construct the model. Uh, and cross-validation is, is just one approach to, uh, to addressing this uh, type of a problem. Um, and, and in particular, it's geared toward scenarios where we have very limited amounts of data available to us. And, and again, we'll get into this here in, in a few weeks where we start talking more about doing cross-validation with uh, a training set, a validation set, and a, a test set. And, and this is the, actually the type of cross-validation that you're going to be wanting to use uh, as we move forward.